Today, dangerous yet diminutive dragons, I'm on silent, and this is Spyro the Dragon. 21 years ago, Insomniac Games unleashed their first iconic character. Spyro was a tiny dragon with a big attitude who was symbolic of 1990s culture. 20 years later, Spyro got the remaster treatment with the PlayStation 1 trilogy of games being updated and brought to modern consoles. So two decades removed from being a smash hit game and one of the iconic mascot characters of the early days of PlayStation, Spyro is reignited for a new generation. But how has the original Spyro the Dragon survived two decades of the evolution of gaming? Let's look back in the first episode of The Retrospective. Spyro the Dragon was created as part of Sony's push to aim the PlayStation at a younger demographic. While the competing Nintendo 64 had many games that are considered all-time classics, its library could be easily described as skewing younger. While Nintendo had the likes of GoldenEye, rated T for Teen, and Perfect Dark, rated M for Mature, most of the N64's lineup were rated below that. Its signature games were the Super Mario series and its spin-offs, along with The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, Donkey Kong and its spin-offs, Banjo-Kazooie and Star Fox 64, to name a few. While they're timeless, or at least fondly remembered classics, they were pretty low on the ESRB's content rating scale. When you look back at the top games in the PlayStation 1's lineup, most of them are in the T to M range, such as Metal Gear Solid, Castlevania, and Tomb Raider. Sure, you have some E-rated games high on those lists like Gran Turismo and Ape Escape, two of my all-time favorite games. But based on critical and fan reception, the top end of Sony's library tended to skew a little older when you compare it to Nintendo of the time. And that brings us back to Spyro. When Insomniac first conceptualized Spyro the Dragon, it was a much more realistic take on the dragon, if you take my meaning. Rather than the bright and whimsical E-rated platformer that became a smash hit, it was going to be darker and grittier and whatever other buzzword that the modern gaming industry likes to throw around to market their games. Take on the dragon. Enter Mark Cerny. You've probably heard of him. He's the mind behind Knack. Knack 2, baby! His more recent contributions to gaming aside, the man was a certifiable gaming legend in the 90s. He was a designer and producer on the Crash Bandicoot series and later the Spyro series for Universal Interactive Studios who published both franchises on the PlayStation 1. It was Cerny who had suggested that Insomniac make a game with more mass market appeal. The Spyro ceased to be something out of Game of Thrones and became the game that we know and love today. For me, that was probably for the best, as apparently the only kid in the neighborhood whose parents realized the games had content ratings, an M-rated Spyro the Dragon game wouldn't have gone over too well in the Unsilent household. It would have certainly been on the lengthy list of great games I've never played. An E-rated game with a sassy protagonist that would comically take out baddies and unsuspecting sheep on the other hand. That went over rather well before you get into the fact that this is a really great game. In Spyro the Dragon, you play as the titular dragon Spyro, of course. He's the only dragon left after Nasty Nork uses his magic to trap all of the other dragons in crystal and turns their treasure into a Nork army while thieves steal unhatched dragon eggs. As the last remaining free dragon, it's up to Spyro to free the dragons, recover the treasure, and retrieve the eggs. While platformer games have an implicit goal of get through the level, stomp the enemies, and collect everything that you can get your hands, or claws, on, Insomniac made sure that the main goal stared you right in the face at the start of the game. Whether it's the full game or its demos, Spyro always starts in the artisan homeworld, where the frozen dragon nester is right in front of you. Thank you for releasing me, Spyro. Free ten dragons in the artisan world. Then find the balloonist. He'll transport you to the next world. What about Nasty Nork? I'm going after him. Find dragons first. That's all I can tell you. After telling you what to do and how to progress, it's up to you to free the dragons of all the dragon realm. Prior to playing Spyro, my platformer experience was pretty limited. Prior to having a PS1, all Kaza Unsilent had was an NES, so my platformer CV was limited to side-scrollers. Even Crash 3, the first game I had for my PlayStation 1, was linear except for the two flying levels. Spyro's linearity was limited to the straight path to your first dragon. 
After that, you could go any which way in the artisan homeworld, through any of the world portals you could find, and any way you desired in those worlds. Even in the first Spiral world I played, Dark Hollow, on the demo disc that came with my PS1, there were options to going through the level. I could go left, off to the big enemies there. I could go straight ahead, which would take me towards the exit. Or I could explore that path hidden the way to the right. And that's just one level, but that sets the stage for most of the levels of Spyro. With few exceptions, Spyro had this fantastic level design that allowed you to explore with each section of a level having enemies, treasure, dragons, and little tricks to keep it interesting. Sure, there were a few levels that were fairly linear. Town Square, also a level accessible in the first area of the game, was fairly linear, bar one big glide to help you 100% the level. Fortunately, linear levels were more the exception than the rule. But it's the levels that breathe life into this game. Every level had its own theme and identity. Sure, they're all rooted around their homeworld's theme. The deserts and canyons of the Peacekeeper's homeworld is reflected in the design of most of its levels, which differs greatly from the wizardry on display in Magic Crafters and the surrealism of Dreamweavers, for example. These design themes are reflected in world design, platforming challenges, the enemy design, and the music. The home world acts like hubs, but not in the same sense of Crash Bandicoot 3, to go back to my gaming history again, where the hub is just a way to access levels. In Spyro 1, the home world was a hub to access levels, a level in and of itself, and a way to show story and theme rather than just telling it. So if you played through the Beastmaker's homeworld and saw a bunch of different levels, you could identify which of those levels were part of the Beastmaker's because of the theme of that homeworld, because the theme of that homeworld permeated through the level design of its children levels. And each of these levels put Spyro skills to use. Our quadrupedal friend could put his feet to good use by charging into enemies and spearing them with his horns. Being a dragon, he could also make use of his flame breath. It's not Drogon levels of overpowered, but it can take down some pretty big enemies and watch out if a fairy powers him up. And since Spyro isn't a fully grown dragon yet, he can't fly outside of special flight stages, which the racer in me loved and still loves. However, Spyro can glide long distances with just a little bit of altitude drop as he glides forward, so we can't keep going forever. Gliding is Spyro's primary platforming skill. He could jump too, but you'll probably be doing more gliding than jumping to treasure enemies, thieves, and dragons, especially in the later levels. Spyro's attacking skills also have specific purposes. While most of the smaller enemies can be defeated with a flame or a charge, specific attacks are required for certain enemies. Fortunately, the dragons you free will give you those hints. They're not just there for collecting and jokes, though you'll learn more about Spyro and the Dragon Realm through what some dragons say. Many dragons will give you hints, like you can't charge large enemies, and you can't flame enemies with metal armor or shields. Of course, you'll figure that out for yourself when you try to said enemy bop Spyro on the head for annoying them. And I will note that because most levels have their own unique enemies, Insomniac added a little wrinkle to each so you have to change your approach to them. Some levels even have a unique way to kill enemies, be it through using a super flame or using their weapons against them. Other times you have to change your timing or approach to stay alive. It's easy to say flame or charge or charge or flame, but the freedom in level crafting that Insomniac allowed themselves permeates through to the enemy design which also impacts the combat. But on the whole, no, the combat in Spyro is not that difficult. There were few aspects of the game that were criticized by the gaming press back in 1998, but the difficulty was certainly one of them. When it came to making a game that appealed to younger gamers, it seems as though the enemy difficulty was turned down to make life easier for kids playing it. That's not to say that you won't die to Nasty's Patsies. In the latter half of the game, the enemies do get more difficult and took a few lives off me. Some platforming also got me as well. It's not a walk in the park, but it won't tax experienced gamers either. The difficulty in the game will come if you want to 100% it. You shouldn't have too much of a problem freeing dragons, retrieving eggs, and gathering treasure required to progress to the next dragon world regardless of age or skill. To gather everything that Nasty has taken from the dragons will take some more skill. 
There are some tricky glides and platforming puzzles that require some practice and lost lives in order to get everywhere on some maps, treetops being the worst or at least the most challenging in my opinion. The boss levels of Metalhead and Jacques have some pretty tricky approaches to getting all the treasure there too. In all, it took me about 6 hours to 100% Spyro the Dragon ahead of making this review, but that was also the third time that I completely completed the game. The other two times being on the PS1 and in the Reignited Trilogy remake of Spyro 1. In doing research for this review, I've heard Spyro referred to as both a platformer and a collectathon, and I don't think that defining Spyro the Dragon by one specific descriptor is accurate. While the main goal of the game isn't to defeat Nasty Nork, it is an important one. Important enough for Spyro's first line to be, Where's Nasty Nork? I'll torch him! Important enough for an ending cutscene and credits to roll after defeating him. There's a special ending, though, that rolls after freeing all the dragons, rescuing all the eggs, and retrieving all the treasure. One ending leans you towards Platformer, the other suggests Collectathon. In reality, Spyro doesn't exist without some element of either. That is to say that the story doesn't work without the goal to recover every dragon and gem, but there's no game to collect everything without all the platforming puzzles to get to that last dragon and gem. One thing I noticed when I was going back to play Spyro for this review was that the art held up. Sure, the graphics are PlayStation 1 graphics, the Reignited Remaster updated all visuals with more detail, the animations had more life to them, there was a larger variety to the enemy and dragon looks. However, to preteen me, the game looked just as good in 1998 as people said the remastered version did in 2018. And that's because the game's art style is timeless. Spyro had a simple, straightforward design using bright colors that is timeless. It's kind of like classic cartoons. They don't use all the fancy computer animated tricks of modern cartoons, but that doesn't mean the classic Disney and Warner Brothers cartoons look worse than the much more expensive modern Star Wars cartoons, for example. You don't need all the detail that today's more powerful gaming hardware provides to understand what you're looking at. Just because Reignited looks better than the original doesn't mean that it looks any different than the original. As I mentioned earlier in the video, the brilliant use of theme visually connecting the levels of the various dragon worlds together plays a large part in the brilliant visual design that holds up over the course of two decades and four console generations. Of course, coming back to play it 21 years later, you do notice a few issues. The music doesn't loop particularly well. It's kind of amazing considering the praise, and justifiably so, for the soundtrack that it has a little issue that detracts ever so slightly from it. If memory serves, this was fixed when you use the original music when playing the Reignited Remaster. The third-person camera is certainly the worst part of the game. Even choosing the active camera mode, which does a better job of following Spyro's movement than the default passive camera, the camera always feels like it's too lethargic and turning to follow Spyro to be a lot of help. It will occasionally get you hurt or killed, be it from enemies or platforming. In subsequent games, and in the reignited version of Spyro 1, there was a control to recenter the camera behind Spyro, but the original game would only recenter the camera after pushing the zoom button, triangle, or by charging. The writing has a big whiff of 90s attitude. Very Bart Simpson, to use a pop culture reference point. Considering The Simpsons' early run was counterculture, the comparison fits, though comparing 1998 Spyro to 1998 Simpsons when the show was more desperate to be accepted by celebrity pop culture than critical of it, well, let's just compare Golden Age 3D platformers to Golden Age Simpsons for this one. And if we're going to reference back to Reignited, while there are 80 dragons for Spyro to rescue, in the original, many used the same models, animations, and voice actors, and a few used the same generic Thank you for releasing me! line. For better or worse, Reignited didn't change the lines from the original, but the dragon models, animations, and actors were all updated so that every dragon was unique in how it looked, acted, and sounded, even if all they said was Thank you for releasing me! That extra effort was something that the kid me appreciated and reignited. 
the reignited trilogy and the renewed attention that it brought our little purple friend notwithstanding, Spyro is a little overlooked in gaming history. If you look at its genre, you had Super Mario 64, Crash Bandicoot, Banjo-Kazooie, Donkey Kong 64, and more released right around when Spyro 1 came out. And that doesn't include the countless great platformers that came before and after the N64 PS1 console generation. If you look at gaming in 1998, it might just be the greatest year in the history of the medium. Many of the year's best games are on the greatest of all time lists. Many years, you'll see one or two games that are contention in for that top of all time list. In 1998, there were over a dozen games that could have easily made a top 100 or so games of all time list, including Half-Life, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, Grim Fandango, Metal Gear Solid, Pokemon Red and Blue in North America, Fallout 2, Resident Evil 2, Crash Bandicoot 3 Warped, Thief, Banjo-Kazooie, F-Zero X, Star Wars Rogue Squadron, StarCraft, and StarCraft Brood War. Yes, all of those games and Spyro came out in one year. When people talk about the greatest years for gaming of all time, it may have come two decades ago. We've just come off a year that had God of War and Red Dead Redemption 2 as the year's top games. You can argue that 2018 might have had higher peaks than 1998, but 1998 has way more of those peaks than last year. Back to our Purple Dragon friend, I count Spyro on my personal list of the top 100 games of all time, but even I will readily concede that most experts probably aren't wrong to rank Spyro a long way behind many of the games on that 1998 list. If you bundled the PS1 Spyro games together as a trilogy, kind of like the Reignited trilogy, you've got games that, as a collective, jump up pretty high on that list. While I'm not here to talk about the Spyro sequels, they added so much in terms of mini-games, abilities, new characters, and story in Ripto's Rage and Year of the Dragon that they really are sequels that capture the spirit of the original and improve on it. I don't mean to sell the original short, but Spyro the Dragon was a good game, but it almost is better serving as a jumping off point for Insomniac to work their magic on the rest of the trilogy. By the way, if you were wondering, after the PlayStation 1, Insomniac moved on to other games including Ratchet & Clank, Resistance, and most recently Spider-Man. Spyro moved into the hands of other developers to mixed results at best. The Game Boy Advance games were reasonably well received, except for an ironic crossover of PS1 mascot characters on a Nintendo system with Crash Bandicoot. The PlayStation 2 and GameCube and Xbox games were far less fondly regarded. Things were so bad that Spyro had a 10 year break between Dawn of the Dragon and Reignited, a franchise that had been an annual release every year for over a decade was dead. And no, Skylanders doesn't count since its primary purpose is to sell gimmicks. Even with a popular and critically acclaimed remaster, there's no news on the horizon of new Spyro games. The same problem that befell Crash Bandicoot, which got its remaster in 2017, also befell Spyro. While both rose to fame as mascots of the PlayStation, they weren't Sony's intellectual property. Both were owned by Universal, which then merged with Vivendi in 2000, and some mergers and acquisitions later ended up under the Activision banner thanks to the 2008 merger. Probably not coincidentally, that was when the annual releases for both franchises came to an end. Given the quality of the games of both franchises under Vivendi, it was probably for the best. One has to wonder what the fates of Crash and Spyro would have been if Sony owned the rights to their PS1 mascots. Nintendo and Sega kept their mascot characters in-house and empowered them to massive console sales. Well, it did and still does for Nintendo. Sonic is still popular and still has some good games thanks to Sonic Mania and the racing games. You would think that Sony would pull out all the stops to ensure the commercial and critical success of its mascot characters if it owned Spyro and Crash. Instead, neither thrived after leaving the PS1. And it's a shame because the classic Spyro games hold a special place in my heart. I very seldom 100% games, but Spyro the Dragon was the first one I did play to its absolute completion. 
I also did that with Ripto's Rage, Year of the Dragon, and the Reignited Trilogy equivalents. I, I still count it as complete, even if I don't have all those ridiculous trophies, because chasing achievements isn't my idea of fun. To see a series that had the potential to be iconic in gaming have such a swift downfall to near complete obscurity is heartbreaking. I might feel about the franchise and its future if it wasn't cashed in on for terrible sequels, but instead just a beloved trilogy of great games. And that's my retrospective on Spyro the Dragon. I consider it an all-time classic. Not everyone feels the same way. Maybe that's in part because of the legacy of the franchise. Maybe that's just because of the games that came out around it. But me, this, as I said, ranks as a top 100 all-time game. What do you think of Spyro the Dragon? Just the original game. We'll talk about the sequels at another point in time. But the original Spyro the Dragon, what did you think of it? Does it rate for you on your all-time great games list? Let me know down in the comments below. If you like this video, hit the like button, subscribe if you're new, share on social media, follow on social media. The social media handle is on Silent On Air, and that is for Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. And don't forget, you could check out more great classic games on the channel. We've got some on the screen in the description down below and more videos anytime on the channel page. And until the next time, I'm on Silent. Thanks very much for joining me. Like, share, subscribe, and we will see you next time.